Hello, and welcome to Historical Humans Reads, where we take primary sources and bring them to your screen. I'm Cullum Coleman, and today we are reading from The South Pole by Roald Amundsen. Published in 1912, The South Pole is Amundsen's autobiographical account of his 1911 journey to become the first man in history to ever reach the South Pole, and his race against the British Navy and Robert Falcon Scott to do so. Published in two volumes, the work's full title is The South Pole, an account of the Norwegian Antarctic Expedition in the Fram, 1910-1912. Composed in Amundsen's native Norwegian, our translation today is that of A.G. Chatter. Today we will be reading the opening paragraphs of Chapter 8, A Day at Framheim. With that, let's begin. In order to understand our daily life better, we will now make a tour of Framheim. It is June 23rd, early in the morning. Perfect stillness lies over the barrier. Such stillness as no one who has not been in these regions has any idea of. We come up the old sledge road from the place where the Fram used to lie. You will stop several times on the way and ask whether this can be real. Anything so inconceivably beautiful has never yet been seen. There lies the northern edge of the Fram barrier, with it Mounts Nelson and Oronikin nearest. Behind them, ridge after ridge, peak after peak, the venerable pressure masses rise, one higher than another. The light is so wonderful. What causes this strange glow? It is clear as daylight, and yet the shortest day of the year is at hand. There are no shadows, so it cannot be the moon. No, it is one of the few really intense appearances of the aurora australis that receives us now. It looks as though nature wished to honor our guests and to show herself in her best attire. And it is a gorgeous dress she has chosen. Perfectly calm, clear with a starry sparkle, and not a sound in any direction. But wait, what is that? Like a stream of fire, the light shoots across the sky, and a whistling sound follows the movement. Hush, can't you hear? It shoots forward again, takes the form of a band, and glows in rays of red and green. Then stands still for a moment, thinking of what direction it shall take and then away again, followed by an intermittent whistling sound. So nature has offered us on this wonderful morning one of her most mysterious, most incomprehensible phenomenon, the audible southern light. Now you'll be able to go home and tell your friends that you have personally seen and heard the southern lights, for I suppose you have no doubt that you have really done so. Doubt how can one be in doubt about what one has heard with one's own ears and seen with one's own eyes? And yet you have been deceived, like so many others. The whistling northern and southern lights have never existed. They are only a creation of your own yearning for the mystical, accompanied by your own breath, which freezes in the cold air. Goodbye, beautiful dream. It vanishes from the glorious landscape. Perhaps it was stupid of me to call attention to that, my guests have now lost much of the beautiful mystery, and the landscape no longer has the same attraction. Meanwhile, we have come up past Nelson and Ronakin, and are just climbing the first ridge. Not far away, a big tent rises before us, and in front of it we see two long, dark lines. It is our main depot that we are coming to, and you can see that we keep our things in good order, case upon case, as if they had been placed in position by an expert builder, and they all point the same way. All the numbers face north. What made you choose that particular direction is the natural question. Had you any special object? Oh, yes, we had. If you will look towards the east, you will notice that on the horizon, the sky has a rather lighter, brighter color there than in any other part. That is the day as we see it now. At present, we cannot see to do anything by its light. It would have been impossible to see 
of these cases were lying on their numbers to the north if it had not been for the brilliant aurora australis. But that light color will rise and grow stronger. At nine o'clock, it'll be in the northeast, and we shall be able to trace it 10 degrees above the horizon. You would not then think it gave so much light as it really does, but you would be able, without an effort, to read the numbers. What is more, you would be able to read the maker's names, which are marked on several of the cases. And when the flush of daylight has moved to the north, you will be able to see them even more clearly. No doubt these figures and letters are big, about two inches high and 14 inches broad, but it shows, nevertheless, that we have daylight here at the darkest time of the year. So there is not the absolute darkness that people think. The tent that stands behind these contains dried fish. We have a great deal of that commodity, and our dogs can never suffer hunger. But now we must hurry on, if we are to see how the day begins at Framheim. What we are passing now is the Mark flag. We have five of them standing between the camp and the depot. They are useful on dark days, when the east wind is blowing and the snow falling, and there on the slope of the hill you see Framheim. At present, it looks like a dark shadow on the snow, although it is not far away. The sharp peaks you see pointing to the sky are all of our dog tents. The butt itself you cannot see. It is completely snowed under and hidden in the barrier. But I see you are getting warm with walking. You will go a little more slowly so that you won't perspire too much. It is not more than negative 51 degrees, so you have every reason to be warm walking. With that temperature and calm weather like today, one soon feels warm if one moves about a little. The flat place we have now come down to is a sort of basin. If you bend down and look round the horizon, you will be able with an effort to follow the ridges and hummocks the whole way round. Our house lies on the slope we are now approaching. We chose that particular spot as we thought it would offer the best protection, and it turned out we were right. The wind, as we have had has nearly always come from the east when there was any strength in it. And against such winds, the slope provides an excellent shelter. If we had placed our house over there where the deep pot stands, we should have felt the weather much more severely. But now you must be careful when we come near to the house so that the dogs don't hear us. We have now about 120 of them. And if once they start making a noise, then goodbye to a peaceful polar morning. Now we are there, and in such daylight as there is, you can see the immediate surroundings. You can't see the house, you say. No, I can quite believe it. That chimney sticking out of the snow is all that is left above the barrier. This trap door we are coming to, you might take for a loose piece of boarding thrown out on the snow. But that is not the case. It is the way down into our home. You must stoop a bit when you go down into the barrier. Everything is on a reduced scale here in the polar regions. We cannot afford to be extravagant. Now you have four steps down. Take care, they are rather high. Luckily, we have come in time to see the day has started. I see the passage lamp is not yet lighted, so Lindstrom has not turned out. Take hold of the tail of my anorak and follow me. This passage in the snow that we are in leading to the penthouse. Oh, I'm sorry, you must forgive me. Did you hurt yourself? I quite forgot to tell you to look out for the threshold above the penthouse door. It is not the first time someone has fallen over it. That's a trap we have all fallen into. But now we know it, and it doesn't catch us anymore. If you'll wait a second, I'll strike a match, and then we shall see our way. Here we are in the kitchen. Now make yourself invisible and follow me all day, and you will see what our life is like. As you know, it is St. John's Eve, and so we shall only work during the forenoon. But you will be able to see how we spend a holiday evening. When you send your account home, you must promise me not to paint it in two strong colors. Goodbye for the present. Brr. 
There's an alarm clock. I wait and wait and wait. At home, I am always accustomed to hear that noise followed by the passage of a pair of bare feet across the floor and a yawn or so. Here, not a sound. When Amundsen left me, he forgot to say where I could best put myself. I tried to follow him into the room, but the atmosphere there, no thanks. I could easily guess that nine men were sleeping in a room 19 feet by 13 feet. It did not require anyone to tell me that. Still not a sound. I suppose they only keep that alarm clock to make themselves imagine they are turning out. Wait a minute, though. Lindstrom, Lindstrom. He went by the name of Lindstrom, not Lindstrom. Now, by Jove, you've got to get up. The clock's made row enough. That's whistling. I know his voice. I know him at home. He was always an early bird. A frightful crash. That's Lindstrom stripping out of the bunk. But if he was late in turning out, it did not take him long to get into his clothes. One, two, three, and there he stood in the doorway, the little lamp in his hand. It was now six o'clock. He looked well, round and fat, as when I saw him last. He is in his dark blue clothes with a knitted helmet over his head. I should like to know why. It is certainly not cold in here. For that matter, I have often felt it colder in kitchens at home in the winter, so that cannot be the we reason. Oh, I have it. He is bald and doesn't like to show it. That is often the way with bald men. They hate anyone seeing it. The first thing he does is to lay the fire. The range is under the window, and it takes up half of the six feet by thirteen feet kitchen. His method of laying a fire is the first thing that attracts my attention. At home, we generally begin by splitting sticks and laying the wood in very carefully. But Lindstrom just shoves the wood in anyhow, all over the place. Well, if he can make that barn, he's clever. I'm still wondering how he will manage it, when suddenly he stoops down and picks up a can. Without the slightest hesitation, as though it was the most natural thing in the world, he pours paraffin over the wood. Not one or two drops, oh no, he throws on enough to make sure. A match... And then I understand how Lindstrom got to life. It was smartly done, I must say, but Hassel ought to have seen it. Amundsen had told me something of their arrangements on the way up. I knew Hassel was responsible for coal, wood, and oil. This has been an excerpt from the South Pole on Historical Humans Reads. If you enjoyed this video and like to hear more excerpts from original texts, please subscribe to be notified of the next one. If there is a work you would like to hear, be sure to like the video and leave a comment listing it below. Thank you for listening.